أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل وسل وبارك على محمد وعلى آله وأصحاب سيدنا محمد وبارك وسلم اللهم صل على محمد في أول كلامنا اللهم صل على محمد في أوسط كلامنا اللهم صل على محمد في آخر كلامنا اللهم صل على محمد كلما ذكره الذاكرون وصل على محمد كلما غفل عن ذكره الغافلون السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته So inshallah today I'm going to keep it very brief than we've done it over the past few weeks uh, for a number of reasons but today I just want to briefly touch upon um, the aspect of prophecy of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he's a Nabi we believe him to be a Nabi, a Rasul and I want to just very, very briefly today talk about how even before he became a prophet, at what age did he become prophet? Forty. At the age of 40, right? We know that. At the age of 40, the Prophet wasallam was bestowed with Nubuwa. He was told that now you are a prophet. So it's a very heavy burden <coughs> and huge responsibility to be placed on his shoulders, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. It's a magnanimous event, a huge event. Huge event in human history to be visited by Jibreel alayhi salatu salam, one of the greatest angels, creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the ulama talk about how every time when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was receiving revelation, right? We know that the revelation came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in portions, right? It came according to questions that were asked, it came according to situations. But that was from the Sama ul Ard. Before that, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had already downloaded the entire Quran, but Jibra'il would come and bring it to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And certain ayat, certain surahs of the Quran were also accompanied by thousands of other angels as well. The ulama tell us, Imam Suyuti mentions this in his itqan, that this was because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to show us the magnificence of the Quran. And there were also angels whose duty only when a revelation came was to protect the Quran as it was coming down with Jibreel salam. In other words, to protect shaitan from shaitan. That he would somehow try and disturb the revelation. So we believe that the Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam received divine revelation, wahi. Unimpeded. Unimpeded means there was no interference about receiving revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So our connection with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is a very deep connection. He was a human being, but he also was blessed to receive revelation. If he was an angel, as Allah mentions in the Quran, people would make excuses and say, well, we can't follow him. We can't follow his way because he's an angel. He's not like us, right? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made him just like us human beings. وَمَا جَعَلْنَاهُمْ جَسَدًا لَا يَأْكُلُونَ الطُعَامَ وَمَا كَانُوا خَالِدِينَ that he had a human um, body like everybody else. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected him. And even before he became a prophet, in fact, even his entire family, his entire nasl, his, his lineage was protected from any form of corruption. They were monotheists, muwahidun. Muwahideen, muwahideen, i.e. they believe only in one true Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So none of his parents, none of his grandparents engaged in anything that was against the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even before Islam. This is something that we also believe as well. So his lineage was also pure. His progeny was also pure. Right? He came from Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, all the way back from Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam, back to Adam alayhi salatu wasalam as well. So the prophecy was already told before he, was, he became a prophet as well. In fact, we know that his nubu was, was bestowed upon him even before he became a prophet. The formal prophethood happened at the age of 40. There's a hadith, many a hadith mentioned, the Prophet ﷺ mentions himself that I was a prophet even when Adam والسلام, was between water and clay. In other words, his prophethood was already ordained for him as well. In some places it says between Adam والسلام, being a soul and a body. والسلام. In other words, he was already a prophet, even in the loins of Adam والسلام, and Nuh والسلام, Ibrahim والسلام, and وغيرة, وغيرة, and so on. He was already a prophet as well. So the 40th year was when he experienced the prophetic experience as well. 
Okay. And Anas ibn Malik radiallahu ta'ala an uh, mentions that when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam entered, when he was there, when he was present amongst them, the whole Medina, the whole atmosphere was illuminated. Right? It's also worth bearing in mind that when the companions mention things about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you should also be aware that when did they know him? Did they know him in Makkah? Did they know him in Medina? Many of them were little children when they... When the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa came. So Anas bin Malik, for example, radiallahu ta'ala an, was a small child at the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam entering Medina. So he only saw the Prophet sallallahu life during the Medinan phase. The same goes for Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu as well. So many companions, Abu Huraira was also as well. So they met the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa at a very young age as well. Anyway, they say, Anas bin Malik says that when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came, there was, there was light everywhere. We felt happy, we felt suru, we felt sakina. His companionship was so powerful that they could never imagine life without the Prophet Sallallahu Today, arguably, we know more about the Prophet Sallallahu or we have access rather to more knowledge about the Prophet Sallallahu than any period in human history. Books upon books have been written about every aspect of the Prophet Sallallahu His physical appearance. Right? His life, his battles, all of this is written, all the du'as, everything we have about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We have all these different genres, all these different fields. You go on the internet, you type in YouTube, you find so many bayans about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You have access, direct access, right, of aim of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But the one thing that we don't have, that the companions had, was the direct companionship of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. They experienced prophetic revelation. They were there, they lived with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Khalid bin Walid, for example, during the battle when he heard that something had happened to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in one battle, they say he lost his mind. This, he, he lost his mind not because something had happened. In fact, the, the narration say he heard that the helmet of the Prophet Sallallahu had fallen off. Just the helmet of the Prophet Sallallahu had fallen off. And they say he went mental, he lost himself. That he could not bear it, that the helmet of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had fallen off and he feared the worst. Like them, he was running around the battlefield amongst the enemies. Amongst the enemies, the kuffar, he was running around. He wasn't fighting them, he just lost himself. Like something had happened to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. After the battle was over, they asked him what happened. And he said, you know, I just lost my love for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I could not bear that anything would happen to him. I could not bear that anything would happen to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That I lost my mind, I lost my sense of um, sanity, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then, afterwards he realized that nothing happened to the Prophet But why did this happen? The ulama tell us. Why? Because they, could, they were directly in love with the Prophet Sallallahu They experienced the Prophet Sallallahu They could not imagine life without him. So when you imagine when the Prophet Sallallahu passed away, alayhi salatu wasalam, right? وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ إِلَّا رَسُولٌ قَدْ خَلَتْ مِنْ قَبْلِهَا الرَّسُولٌ أَفَإِمْ مَاتَ أَوْ قُتِلَ انْقَلَبْتُمْ عَلَىٰ عَقَابِكُمْ If he dies or he's killed, are you going to turn back? If you turn away from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if you turn away from the deen of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, it makes no difference to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Right? So this is the way to combine. When Umar made those famous statements, which we'll inshallah at some point talk about, right? And Abu Bakr had to calm him down. Why? Because they had never experienced anything else. The immense love that they had for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So we know, for example, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Riwayat mentioned, before the age of prophethood, before the age of 40, when he, was, when he received formal revelation, at the age of 38, huh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the narrators, the hadith mentioned, Hubbiba ilayhi wal khal khalwa. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam began, Allah was preparing him. He, he prepared himself, he used to go away and spend some time alone. He was noticed. It was noticed about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam even before revelation that he preferred to be in Khalwa. Khalwa means to be alone. This is something the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam preferred. To be alone, away from the bustling city, the metropolis of Makkah al Mukarramah. So this is something that we need to bear in mind as well. And you know the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam experience is such. Let me give you one more example. Inshallah next week we'll continue in more detail. Ikrama, who is the son of Abu, Abu Jahl, who became Muslim. Right? Ikram ibn Abi Jahl, us who belong to the South Asian continent, subcontinent, we are in debt to Ikram ibn Abi Jahl. Ikram ibn Abi Jahl was the one who did the Futuhat, who led the initial conquests, and his father was who? 
Abu Jahl, the enemy of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, but his his son became one of the lieutenants, the commanders of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's army. Subhanallah. They call. Look at the iman. Look at the effect the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had. That Abu Jahl is where, and his son is now spreading Islam. And where did he spread Islam to? The initial futuhat that happened towards where is India and Pakistan now, because of his initial endeavors. Islam was to spread to that part of the world as well. And you know what? He only spent two years with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Ikrama ibn Abi Jahl, two years with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But the suhba was such, the effect of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was such that he 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 took Islam on, and he could not imagine life without the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So this is the effect that the suhba of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had with the companions. They could not imagine life without him, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So two points here we learn very very quickly before we move on. That suhba, companionship is essential. It's fundamental in our deen. Okay, it's not a point of belief. You don't become a non-Muslim, non-Muslim if you don't believe in it. What I mean is, on our journey to Allah subhanahu wa taala, it's important that we keep companionship with one another. The masjid is a place where we can get a sense of that. That's why it's very, very important that our masajid are places where people can connect with Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. People have role models. People have mashayikh that they can connect with. Our deen is not something that you just learn through books only. Right? What we call in modern term bibliocentric. You need books and books. Right? Reading books and books and books is not sufficient. It can help, but it's not sufficient. The importance of suhba. This is something that they don't have in a Western education system. You go to university, you go to college, you get your PhD, you get your masters, and you move on. Right? How many people keep in touch with their teachers, their lecturers? But in our tradition, even after we graduated, long after we graduated, we keep in touch with our teachers. Right? We learn from them. We go back to them. If we hear that they're not well, we visit them. Right? We keep their suhbat because this is very, very important. So the first lesson we learn here is the importance of suhbat. Of course, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is no longer with us, but we have ulama, pious people who we can look up to, or mashayikh that we can look up to, who can uh, give us a sense of what it would be like and what we need to do in, in our journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In fact, even during the battles, how much love they had for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa even during the battles, you know, what, would they, what was their battle cry? What was their battle cry? Wa Muhammada, wa Muhammada, wa Muhammada. Istighasa, yani seeking help from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is why Khalid bin Walid, when he was running, like he lost his mind in the battlefield because he heard rumors that the Prophet Sallallahu helmet had fallen off. Hmm? Why wasn't he killed? The ulama said, why wasn't he killed? He was there, like he, lost, he wasn't even fighting anybody. He just lost himself, he was perplexed. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam love for his love. And the ulama say because of his love for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he has such a deep bond with the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that that love for him was enough to protect him. Right? So we need to have this deep love for the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Not just in this month, not just on certain days, but throughout our entire life. That we do zikr, we remember him, we send salutations upon the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. We hold majalis where we remember the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam on a regular basis. Hmm? This is very very important, very very important. I'm not going to I'm not going to go into ikhtilaf amongst whether we should do this or that. The other. I'm not interested in those these things. Those things are done. Those tropes are done. Right? Our importance is our connection with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So this is something to bear in mind as well. There are four stages. I'm not going to go into the detail. I'm just going to introduce one. There are four stages that we, re- we see about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam before he becomes a Prophet. Before he becomes a Prophet, there are stages, maqam. Right? And the Sufi ulama, Sufi akira will also tell you about this as well. But we're not going to go into that. We're just going to touch upon one thing and I'll end with that inshallah, just for today. There's four stages before he reached Prophethood, the Mashaikh tell us. Number one was the Hanafiya. Hanifa Muslima. Allah subhanahu wa talks about Ibrahim alayhi salatu salam. He was a Hanif. He was upon the right path. He was upon the fitra. He was a man who himself was an army. He was an ummah unto himself. Allah mentions about Ibrahim alayhi salatu salam as being an, a Nabi who was an ummah unto himself. That was his level of Iman. Right? Look at us today, thousands, millions of us, right? But they're playing with us. They mock us, they joke us, joke with us. And na'udhu billahi min zayk. But in those times, right, one prophet, he was equal to entire ummah onto himself, alayhi salatu salam. So the first stage was the Hanafiya, right? Hanifa Muslima, that being of, not the Hanafi fiqh, I'm not talking about this. 
This is Hanifa being upon a natural path. Um, natural fitra. Like what is fitra? Fitra is that you naturally incline and you come to recognize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That your religion and your approach to Islam and your submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is balanced. Mu'tadil, i'tidal. That there's no extremism in your religion. You're not, you're not hard on people. You're not harsh on people. Right? You're lean. You're, lean. you're like, like the Quran says, layin. You are gentle with people. Allah talks about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as well that he was gentle with people. He was soft with people. He was loving with people. Yes, there were times when he had to be strong, but generally his mizad was to bring people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the first stage is the Hanafiya. The second stage is the Wilaya. A person has this maqam of Wilaya. And we'll talk about this inshallah, about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his maqam of Wilaya. The third stage is what's called Nubuwa, the prophecy. His maqam of nubuwa. And the fourth stage is his maqam as, a, as, as prophethood, risala. He comes with a, a book. He comes with a book that's for entire humankind. Okay? And this is something that I'm going to talk about it as well. But I just want to conclude with this, inshallah, and end here, inshallah. That the first one was Hanafi. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in his time, was upon a natural path. Not just him. There were people before him, and next week I'll talk about them. People who weren't Muslims. Yani Islam hadn't quite reached them. Zaid bin Amr ibn Nawfal was an example, and I'll talk about him next week. Right? That he was someone who became who, who was on the Hanafiya, who was on this natural path. They weren't Muslims themselves because the Prophet ﷺ became a prophet, but they had already passed away. But they were also the Prophet ﷺ talked about them. The Prophet ﷺ mentioned them, their, their maqam as well. So the Prophet ﷺ, in his time when he became a prophet eventually. And many of these people who follow the Hanif path, Hanafiya path are usually the odd people in the community. Right? Most of the people, like we know, for example, that prior to Prophet, ﷺ, prior to his age of 38, society around him was entirely corrupted. There was fitna, there was facade everywhere. Okay? And um, and the, the normal thing was to worship gods besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? So everybody else was mushrikeen. Everybody else worshipped gods other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They engaged in idolatry. They worship asnam. Right? Na'budul asnam. They used to worship gods besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In fact, this epoch, this, if you look in the book, they'll tell you that even this age of ignorance is split into different stages. But this particular when Makkah al Mukarramah began 500 years ago. 500 years ago, some of Amr al Khuza'a, from the Khuza'a tribe, what happened was he brought some gods over. 500 years before the Prophet, you know the ones that are mentioned, Hubal, Lat, Wamanat, all of these gods were brought over. It's amazing, like, you know, imagine the sin that is on this person because he, anyone who begins something evil, they also get the punishment for it. And Islam also tells us that when you start something good, you get a reward for it as well. So the second thing besides sohbat is what I want to talk about is that if you start something good in your community, uh, if you start a hasana, you get the reward for it and everyone who does amal on that hasana, you get a reward for it. You teach someone one hadith, you teach someone one amal, one amal. Brother, do ta'lim at home five minutes every day. You're at home doing your stuff, you still get the ajr. You bring one person to the masjid, you bring one person to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Right? And that person might not never ever meet you again. They might never talk to you again, but you're getting the reward for it. Imagine the companions when they fought all the maghazi, all the battles, how much reward they're getting today. And all the people have become Muslim. So we need to make fikr in our community. We need to have this vision that every time I'm giving nasiha to somebody, first I'm giving it to myself, but I'm also building my akhirah. People say, why to mashaykh? Why do you do so much? Khidmat of deen, calm down, relax, enjoy, enjoy life. Why? Because they're not looking at this dunya. They're looking at the akhirah. The more effort that I make, the more fikr that I make, every child, every mother, every daughter that practices deen is my ajr, it's my reward. Every person that comes to the masjid, every person that has a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, every person that does amal, inshallah, for me, that's a form of ajr. That's the way we need to look at our relationships as well. Right? And we really care about people. We love to bring people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're not bringing them to anything but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's also worth remembering as a point of remembrance. That we bring people to Allah. Right? We bring people to a remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa when he came into this environment, he was born into this community. 
it, Makkah became a place full of uh, polytheism. They were worshipping gods besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or they took other gods with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Like they had specific roles to do certain things that they would fulfill. So they fell into a form of ignorance. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa if you can use this phrase, he was a social religious deviant in the sense of the normal thing in that time was what? To worship gods. The normal thing in that time was to bury your daughters alive. All of these practices were normal. And we see it today as well. So many things are normalized. So many things are normalized today that we feel, they make us feel like we're deviants. We're like, we're like the abnormal people. But what I want to show you today, my third point is this, that you will feel like that. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, did you not, do you not think that in his time he must have felt that way? And the people that we'll talk about next week, they must have felt that way as well. Right? For example, Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nawfal himself, he, used to, he was so proud of his Iman, even though he wasn't a Muslim in the sense of he didn't meet the Prophet ﷺ, but he had Tawheed in him. They say that he used to go to the Kaaba and all the polytheists was there and he used to say to them that I'm a monotheist. Yani I'm, I'm on the Tawheed path and he was not afraid of telling people this. Everybody else was in, engaged in what? Shirk. Everybody else around the Kaaba. But he would go to the Kaaba and they say he would hold on to the Kaaba and he would proudly say that I am I'm the only one here who is believing in one God. Right? So sometimes you will be like that. We will feel like that. But we have to remember this has been a journey. Allah says in the Quran um, that very <coughs> most people will never be will never be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. ma yu'minun. Very few people will believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah has told us at the outset. He's told us at the outset that you're not going to be popular. You're not going to be, uh, everybody's not, not everybody's going to accept you. Sometimes you'll be seen as odd people. You'll, you'll stand out. But this is part of being a Muslim. I say this because sometimes people feel like being a Muslim is somehow, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not a good thing to be a Muslim. No, we should be proud Allah's given us Iman. This is very, very important. Wherever you go, whether you're working with non-Muslims, whatever services, whatever industries you're in, whatever education field you're in, we should be proud that we are Muslims and we fulfill the obligation of being a Muslim. A Muslim is what? That a person is safe from you. Assalamu alaikum. When you give salam to a Muslim, why are you signaling to the person? You're telling them that you're safe with me. Right? That when a non-Muslim meets you, they feel safe around you. So this is the way of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That, um, and the, the amazing thing here, and the final thing I want to conclude with, inshallah as well, that I want to take the example of Zayd bin Amr ibn al -Awful. And Google him, you'll find things about him is Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nawfal that um, one of the things that the ulama tell us about certain people like this who, who lived even before the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who were still on the path of Tawheed and Hanafi was that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kept these people around them even the majority were disbelievers to remind them and to prepare for them the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam what do I mean by that? Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala says that when you bring something new into any community, he was a very wise person, radiallahu ta'ala. He said, when you bring something absolutely new to people, they will reject it. If you bring something new, like no one's ever heard of, like in a masjid, musallah, if some maulana comes, and he comes with a new idea, nobody's ever seen that before. Ever, for, for so many years, we've been doing it this way. And it's right, sometimes we should feel this way as well, that why is this person all of a sudden coming out with his new bid'ah? Like, where does it come from? So he says that when you bring something new into a community which people have never seen before, never experienced in that community before, they naturally rally against it. He might even be right. He might even be right what that person has come with, but people rally against it. So Ali radiallahu ta'ala says that uh, we learn through the example of Zayd ibn Amr ibn Nawfal radiallahu ta'ala that he was allowed, he was there, Allah kept him as a reminder that when the Prophet finally would come and say that I am a Nabi, I am a Prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, people would have some sort of recollection that this is something that exists. This is not something completely new. You knew about this. This was around you. So this is something that's also worth reminding. So we are people who remind other people. Remind other people of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's our duty. It's our duty in living in the West. Living in this part of the country. We can't affect what's happening around the country. But in our own area, in our locality here in Lamak, for example, Right? We have a duty. Whether you accept it or not, you have a duty. Your duty is what? First, that you submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You learn the ways of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Everyone. 
me included, you included, we are all included, mothers, sisters, we are all included in this. Right? And then we find ways, in whatever ways we can, to pass the message on. We reform our community, our own Muslim community, from some of the behaviors and some of the customs and some of the attitudes which have nothing to do with Islam and give a bad image to Islam. But at the same time, we also teach people about the way of the Prophet. We inculcate love for Allah and His Messenger وسلم, in the hearts of people. Right? I gave the example of Khalid bin Walid. Right? All the companions who had deep love for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi who could not imagine life without him. So my, my concluding thing is, my concluding points here before we move on next week inshallah is this. Number one, that it's important, very very important that we keep suhbat, we keep companionship with one another. Okay? And the ways we do that are various. Number one, for us, for male folk is to come to the masjid regularly, to speak with our Muslim brothers, to have conversations with them, keep in touch with them. Very very important. Number two, from the prophetic experience as well, that we learn that um, we have to bring Allah and His Messenger into our lives. We need to do seerah, we need to learn the seerah in our homes. Right? This is just once every week. It's not enough. It's not enough for our, for our children. It's not enough for me and you to only learn a little bit of the Prophet once a week, if that. Every day, farz. We mentioned this when we first started three weeks ago. Ta'aleem at home should start. Read the seed of the Prophet ﷺ with your children. You have it in every language now, not just Arabic, not just Urdu. You have it in English as well. Many good books are being written in English about the Prophet I'll buy it for you if you want. Right? But start it for the sake of your Iman and for the sake of the Iman of your children. Connect them to the love of the Prophet ﷺ. Let your conversations in your house be about the Prophet ﷺ. I wonder how the Prophet ﷺ would do this. Do you know how the Prophet ﷺ would do this? And also, and then we bring the Prophet like he lives amongst us, like he's, he exists amongst us, like he's with us, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Right? And once you do that, through the love of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, so many good things will happen in our lives. Just from our love of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Right? And never belittle any sunnah, any amal of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, never leave it out. And so we do this, it's very, very important as well. Inshallah, Allah Ta'ala will then protect our Iman. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala then will make us such that we will be people who don't need to worry about what's happening elsewhere. We don't need to fear anyone. La yakhafoon alaw matala'im. Allah says they don't fear about people blaming them. They don't fear about anything else. We are Muslims. We submit to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. We follow the greatest human being in human history. Now, that's something to be proud about. There's something that we should know about. There's something we should celebrate. There's something we should tell people about. That we should learn about him. And the best way to bring people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is through the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the way we can do that practically, number one, like I said, is to come to the masjid regularly. But that's not going to be enough in our zamana. We also need to go out and learn the way of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That might mean that we sit in ta'aleem. That might mean that we give qurbani once a month, one weekend a month. One weekend a month, not too much to give. One weekend a month we give for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? We're all busy, we've all got work, we've got commitments, whatever. One weekend a month. Why? Because I want to have the khalwa. What did the Prophet Sallallahu had? At the age of 38, the khalwa. Hubbiba ilayhimul khalwa. He loved khalwa. So sometimes you need time away from the dunya. Right? So give some time on the weekend, give some time in the evening by yourself with some people who can remind you of Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala. And inshallah, through that, the wellsprings of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's love will open for you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first and foremost give me the tawfiq. We've just begun. There's so much that we can go into. But I've talked about Hanafiya, Wilaya, I introduced prophecy, Nubuwa, and uh, Risala. We'll go into those details before we go into life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah give us all the love. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless this community and all the Muslim brothers and sisters wherever they are. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us to the truth. Subhanallah bihamdihi, subhanakallahumma, wa bihamdika nashalu la ilaha illa anta, nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk.